Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good to be together. It's good to see each of you here today. There is a parable that tells of a community of ducks that were waddling off to Duck Church one Sunday to hear their duck preacher. And after they waddled into the duck sanctuary, the service began and the duck preacher spoke eloquently of how God had given the ducks wings with which to fly. And he pounded the pulpit with his beak and said, with these wings, there is nowhere we ducks cannot go. There is no God-given task we ducks cannot accomplish. With these wings, we no longer need to walk through life. We can soar high in the sky. Quacks of amen were shouted throughout the congregation. And the duck preacher concluded his message by exclaiming, with our wings we can fly through life. We can fly. And more ducks quacked out loud amens in response. Well, every duck loved the service. In fact, all the ducks that were present commented what a wonderful, powerful message they had heard from their duck preacher. And then they left the church and waddled all the way home. <laughs> Do we waddle to church, waddle through worship, and then waddle out the same way we waddled in? <laughs> How can that be if we understand what worship is? And more importantly, who it is we are worshiping. Amen. We often talk about loving God. Jesus said it was the first and greatest command to love God with everything we have. But if we don't really get what loving God means, how can we do it? We've learned, hopefully, that to, to love God, we have to first understand how God loved us. We have remembered that this morning. We've sung about it, too. But in loving God, you know, we start on his end, what he has done. God loved us before we had ever heard of or thought of love. We also learn that to love God is to keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, to obey what he says. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We also might take note of something that the love of God is not. Something that is not compatible with the love of God, and that's loving this world. One cannot love what is in rebellion against God and, and, and still love God at the same time. You can't do both things, you see. It's one or the other. And so scripture says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Well, today I want us to consider what naturally happens when we love God. The natural expression of a person who loves God is worship. Lovers of God worship God. When Jesus said to, to love God with everything uh, you were part of, what he meant was to worship God with all that you are, with your whole being. Now, obviously, from, from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through Revelation chapter 22, there are hundreds of biblical texts that address the worship of God in some way. But God's people have, have always been called upon 
to do this. Uh, God's people have always been called upon to ascribe worth to our Creator. That's a pretty good definition of worship, to ascribe worth to the worthy. We have been called to praise God, to celebrate the Christ. Worship is a huge topic in the Bible, uh, Old Testament and New, and, and much has been said about it, and much will be said about it, and, and much could be said about it. But today I just want us to together see very clearly that worship is what one who loves God does. Just, just that basic idea today. When you're filled with the love of God, you will overflow in worship of God. A Christian, by definition, is one who has had the love of God poured into their hearts through the Holy Spirit, Scripture says, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And then what happens is that we offer that abundant love back to God in true worship. It's just sort of a natural, though spiritual, process. So as we think about what it means to love God, we must understand that a big part of that love is expressed in our worship. I want to share a passage of Scripture together from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 12 through 17 this morning. And the apostle does there uh, something that's, I think, very interesting. He uses an analogy. It's, it's an analogy of clothing to teach about the Christian life and what it should be. Uh, in the previous verses to these that we're going to look at, uh, verses 5 through 11 of, first, of uh, Colossians chapter 3, he talks about some things that, that need to be taken off uh, when one becomes a Christian. There's some things we take off. But in what we're going to read, he talks about what the Christian puts on. And it's almost as if it's layer after layer of clothing, each, each one very important, each essential in its own way. But let's read a couple of verses of this, beginning in verse 12, Colossians 3, verse 12. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So you see how he, he talks about these Christian characteristics almost as if they're garments. Um, they're things to be put on. And so the believer puts on compassion and then also kindness and humility and meekness and patience. It's just layer after layer, all a part of Christian clothing. Now, there have been times in history when, when what kind of clothing a believer wore was a really big deal um, and controversial. Uh, maybe not quite as controversial anymore, but I can remember times even in, in my history in, in ministry where um, it was a bit more controversial. I remember as a young person um, that in, in places Christians gathered, even like it's summer camp, it was rare to see shorts. Now, I know that the kids that are camp age now, they're thinking, you mean there was a time when you couldn't wear shorts to come sh summer camp? Yes. Dinosaurs walked with us then. <laughs> but when I was in my young elementary years, we weren't allowed to wear shorts at camp. We had to wear blue jeans mm -hmm. in 95 degree heat at camp all day long. We had it rough. <laughs> now I think eventually wisdom prevailed, but, but there was controversy. You know, none of us liked it much. I remember uh, there was a teacher at uh, High Valley College when I was a student there years ago who was never seen, and I mean never seen, without a white shirt and a tie on. 
And, and I'm being quite literal in that description because this fellow was known to mow his grass in a white shirt and tie. I never believed that until I saw it. He lived right on uh, Main Street, right uh, near the church, and there he was, mowing his grass, bless his heart, in a white shirt and tie. And you know, even today, I suppose there can be disagreements about what's appropriate clothing, uh, when we gather, you know, what we should wear in assembly and so forth. People have strong feelings sometimes, and, and not everyone always agrees about that. But one thing that we have to agree on are the clothes that Paul mentions in our passage here in Colossians 3. We need to make sure as believers to never be caught without these things on. We have to have these things on at least. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Essential clothing. If we're not wearing those, now listen. If we're not wearing those, it doesn't matter what a wit you're wearing on the outside. Doesn't matter at all if you're not wearing these. Then Paul adds to that clothing list in verse 13, doesn't he? Look what he says there. Bearing with one another. That's another layer. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. More internal layers of clothing that we all put on when we put on Christ. And we read that and we might say, that's a lot of layers of clothes. That seems like a lot. Who wears that much? And it is a lot of layers. You ever wear that many layers of clothing on the outside? Uh, forgive me if I've told you this story before. I'm in my fifth year with you. I'm probably recycling stories. But uh, in my first year of church camp, go back to church camp here, which is third grade. My dad was one of the main cogs in church camp and, and directed a week. And so I went the first year I was eligible, which was third grade, and uh, didn't realize that I was supposed to be a reflection on my father, which you'll understand as we get, get into this. But it was actually sort of cold, at least at night that week, uh, sort of cold, rainy week of church camp. And... And so when me and my fellow third grade cabin mates got up each morning, we thought it made all kinds of sense, instead of changing clothes, to just add another layer each day. It's cold. And then we play all day and slide around in the mud, and then we just put on another layer the next day. I came home with about five layers of clothes on at the end of the week. And each one had its own layer of grime caked to it underneath. I got home on Saturday, and Dad took me out back with a hose <laughs> and hosed me off layer by layer. And Mom, I think, stopped screaming sometime on Sunday <laughs> the next day, threatened that I wouldn't go back the next year, but I did go, but uh, I had learned something about personal hygiene by then. <laughs> so, you know, Paul is talking about all these internal Christian layers of clothing here in, in Colossians 3. Internal, how does that work? Look at verse 14. Here's how it works. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's sort of, sort of neat, isn't it? Love brings the whole outfit together. It's that special love, that agape love from God. In fact, the older versions, uh, the King James says something like, it calls it the bond of perfection. The bond of perfection that brings the whole outfit together. 
There's a couple other layers mentioned in verse 15. It mentions the uh, peace of Christ in our hearts and, and then thankfulness. But don't forget what ties it all together, what, what makes the outfit perfect, what unites it all and blends it in perfect harmony, and that's love. And that brings us to worship. Verses 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, love leads to worship. You worship what you love. If God's love is in us, we worship God. And central to the worship of God, according to Paul here, is the word of Christ. Appreciate Myron's emphasis throughout the weekend as he's taught us about our favorite book and our second favorite book. Okay? The word of God is central to this. We, you know, we come to worship and, and we hear from God. God speaks, but he's not the only one who speaks. Notice, we speak. We speak to one another in the context of addressing our praises to God by way of all kinds of songs. Another thing we've learned this weekend. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And through them we ascribe worth to our Creator God and to His Son, our, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Why do we do so? Because we love Him. Because we love him. It's the natural thing for us to do. It's a spiritual thing for us to do. We're so thankful to him that he first loved us and that he has raised us in Christ that we can't do anything other than to worship him and give him glory and praise and devotion. We can't do anything else. One who loves God worships God. If a Christian neglects worship, it's a love problem. Mm -hmm. If one says, I love God, but will not listen to the word of God as it's proclaimed, something's deeply wrong. If one claims to be a believer, yet refuses to speak in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, in the context of Christian worship, it's a heart issue. It's a love problem. But the way it's designed to work is this. We're raised with Christ. That is, we become Christians and we cast off our dirty old clothes and we start to put on all these pure garments, layer after layer. And then we put on love, which binds it all together and makes it all work perfectly. And we are just so full of God and his love that we leak. What do I mean? What, what does a overfull glass of water do? It spills. It leaks. You ever find yourself walking through the house, there's you know, a hot cup of coffee just to the brim, and like, if I get it on this carpet, Tracy's going to kill me. <laughs> Full things spill. They, they leak. And we're to be so full of the love of God that we spill. It pours out of us. It overflows into loving worship of the God who saved us and the Son who died for us. 
We have had a magnificent opportunity this morning in this assembly to wear the clothes God's given us. I'm not talking about these. I'm talking about the ones that the apostle reminded us of. To wear these important clothes with a top coat of love and together to feast on the word of God and to speak to one another as we exalt the God of heaven. I hope you have loved God this morning. Have you loved God this morning? I hope you've loved God this morning because I promise you, God has loved you to the uttermost. If you've never responded to his love, as we always do, we offer you an opportunity to think about that response, your obedient response to what God has done for you in Jesus Christ what Jesus has done for you at the cross, if you need to be baptized into Christ today and start your walk with him, well, we'd love to see that and we would celebrate with you. If you need to come back to him today or just ask your brothers and sisters who love you to pray with you and to strengthen you, we would love to do that. That's what we're about. If we need to take care of something like that publicly, This morning, this song that Myron's about to lead us in is for you to think about and for you to come and let us know. Let's stand, let's sing.